Peter. And again, welcome everyone to today's webinar on the Foundations of Data Use for School Boards, Using Data and Building a Culture of Data Use. As Peter mentioned, this workshop is brought to you by the Urban School Improvement Alliance, which is one of the eight alliances of the Regional Education Laboratory for the Northeast and Islands. So we're welcoming school board and school committee members to today's webinar, as well as some district administrators and uh, potentially some school administrators, as well as some other interested members um, of the education field. So a little bit of background about the motivation for today's webinar. One of the districts that our Urban School Improvement Alliance works with had the idea to train their school board on topics of data literacy and establishing a culture of data use. And we thought that that was a great idea. And so what we did is we collaborated with them in order to develop the materials that you're going to see today. And we wanted to be able to broadcast this material out to a larger audience. And thus, we developed this online workshop to share with you all. So again, my name is Jessica Bailey. And I'm going to be presenting with Sarah Ryan. I am a researcher um, for the RHEL in Northeastern Islands. I focus mainly on educator effectiveness, the Urban School Improvement Alliance, as well as early childhood. Sarah, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here today. We're really excited that you're joining us. My name is Sarah Ryan. I'm also a researcher with the Urban School Improvement Alliance, along with the English Language Learners Alliance and the Northeast College and Career Readiness Alliance. My background's in education policy, and I'm also particularly interested in the uneven distribution of educational opportunity and outcomes among different student groups in our K-12 schools. Paul, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Paul Schlickman. I'm a member of the school committee in Arlington, Mass. School committee is uh, Massachusetts for local school board and past president of the state association. I'm also an urban educator, and I do data uh, and analysis for a living at the Lowell Public Schools. Great. So in just a few minutes, Jessica is going to be reviewing the objectives for today's workshop. And then Paul's just going to be giving us an overview of how school boards and school committees are often looking to use data in today's educational climate. And we'll also give you the opportunity to respond to a quick poll about how your board or committee is using data. As people were joining, we were seeing, um, you know, as those of you who were responding to the poll, that, you know, that there are issues that you're thinking about around data. So what questions should you be asking? Um, does revealing too much to the public just create more problems that you're going to have to deal with as board or committee members? You know, and the concerns about people sort of taking the data and then using that data out of context to further a different agenda. Um, so we're, we're really optimistic that our content today is going to sort of help you start to think about some of those concerns and, and maybe give you some tools for, for dealing with concerns you have around using data. So in part one today, our focus is really going to be on the value of building a strong data use culture in school districts, as well as how the board or school committee might play a role in that process. In this section, we're going to be using a case example from a district we've worked with here in the Northeast, here at the Relney, to consider the board's role in supporting a culture of data use in the district. Then in part two, we'll move into a focus on the school board or school, school committee's own use of data for decision making around policy, budget, governance. And we'll use another case example from a different district that we're also working with here in the Northeast to discuss how using a structured, systematic process for working with data can really support the board's use of data for decision making. Finally, just briefly then, in part three of today's workshop, we'll conclude with some thoughts about how the adoption of data-driven decision-making practices really requires a focused coordination of elements and roles, particularly the roles of the board and the superintendent within the district. There'll be time for questions and answers throughout today's workshop. And feel free to use your chat box you know, to pose questions or comments as we go along or you know, links that you may think are, are relevant resources as well. We'll be sharing some resources um, that you know, we, we feel that may be, may be useful for you in your context as well. Um, so let's just keep moving forward. And Jess is going to review our objectives for today. 
Thank you. So as I mentioned a few min minutes ago, the motivation for this workshop originated from one of our alliance districts. However, we know that the topic of data use among school board members is well documented, and the need to address that data use is really um, a concern among many school board members. And recently, there was an article in the American School Board Journal where one former superintendent stated, it's really important to understand exactly what data you need as a board and how you can use that data well. So today's workshop attempts to address this topic by providing a big picture perspective on the role that school board members can play when it comes to data use. Ultimately, our goal today is to provide you with a springboard from which you can use to identify next steps necessary resources and unanswered questions when it comes to using your own data in your role in building a strong culture of data use. And we do know that every district is different and that you have your own local context, but we want to provide you with content today that will give you some general strategies and information that can be applied to meet your local needs. Specifically, the objectives for today's workshop are for you to reflect on your own use of data, consider two distinct roles that school board members have regarding data use, and understand how to foster a culture of data use among your district stakeholders. Become more informed users of data for decision making and for communication. And lastly, and, and very importantly, to identify practices that facilitate using data to inform decision making, especially for the policy decisions that you all are making. In this workshop, we are not going to address specific strategies for using classroom or school level data, such as how to collect and analyze data for improvement. But we do offer separate workshops um, that do address this topic, one called the Practitioner's Use of Data. And that workshop and the materials for that is actually coming out hopefully by the end of this month and published through the Institute of Education Sciences, IES. And so as part of you signing up for today's webinar, you will receive notica notification when that resource becomes available. But if you do want any more information about that, you can be, feel free to contact us. Our emails are at the very end of this presentation. All right, moving along. Um, so in a 2001 report, the National School Boards Foundation, which was then an initiative of the National School Boards Association, it's since been absorbed into NSBA, but that report, um, it's called The Data Connection. It's a great resource. And, and they actually suggest some of the key ways in which data can help school boards operate most effectively. And given Paul's background as a school committee member here in Arlington, Massachusetts, and former president of the Massachusetts School Committee Association, I'm going to ask him to just take a few minutes to share some thoughts that he has about how school boards really can benefit from the strategic use of data to inform their decision making. So Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you right now. So let's start thinking about what policy is. Policy is really multifaceted, and it's more than just what happens to be hanging out in your policy manual. Manual. Your budget is your probably your biggest policy document because it is setting your priorities. Um, your policy is set in your collective bargaining agreement, and you know little individual decisions you may be making along the way is is in a sense a policy decision that should be informed by data. One of the ones that we encountered is do we close on religious holidays and which ones? And this really is a policy decision, not a religious decision. So we looked at Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Good Friday. We did a parent and staff survey. We looked at attendance patterns. We looked at experience of neighborhood, neighboring districts. Uh, and we made our decision when to open and when not to open based on what kind of a quality school day we could offer and the cost of the substitutes and the cost of the program of having uh, a certain number of absences. Uh, in terms of setting goals, this is an important part of the process. In Arlington, we've set a, uh, a bunch of overarching goals, four actually, which are on our uh, district website. And then we have annual goals and superintendent goals, which we work out in, in a subcommittee setting. And, and this has to be a collaborative process that's targeted on the, uh, the biggest needs of the district. And, and this it becomes an accountability measure, which is shared. It's a support structure, not a punishment tool. That's the biggest thing, is when you talk about accountability, it's a way to support movement toward a goal. Uh, whether it's improving math scores in fifth grade, um, if, if that
that's what's happening. You, the superintendent is diagnosing the problem, developing a plan, presenting to, to the committee, and, and expecting us to fund it and support it because it's not going to work unless we do our part. Um, and uh, the, the, the big thing is, is that as we're doing this, people in the community, teachers, need to see how we are making our decisions based on sound practices and the use of best available data, because you know, the, this inspires confidence in the community. It builds their understanding, and, and, and it uh, models practice for what's going on in our school buildings. So thanks. As Paul shared, school boards or school committees really are needing to use data in a number of ways as they engage in district governance. So before moving forward, we'd like to ask you, those of you who are joining us today, to just share a little bit about how your school board or school committee might be using data. You see various purposes here on your screen. So just take a few seconds and just respond. Just indicate yes or no if this is a way that your board or school committee is currently using data. We recognize that some of you joining us today may not be school board members. But you know, just think about how you might apply these topics to the board in your community or a school board or school committee that you're familiar with. I'm going to give you just a few seconds here to weigh in. So as people are weighing in, it, it looks like we're seeing a fair amount of variability right now in, in how board members are, are using data, right? So in particular, I'm just noticing, right, that um, this issue of sort of understanding the data that you get, including its limitations, um, and that's definitely an issue we're going to be talking a little bit more about today, particularly in part two. Um, and as we move into part one, we're going to be thinking especially about the culture of data use. Um, so this is just interesting. I'm sure it's interesting for me to be looking at these results. I'm sure it's interesting for all of you to be sort of reflecting on, on these different ways for using data as well. So this is just a nice jumping off point as we, as we get ready to move into part one. So Jenny, let's take back to then. Dun, dun, dun. All right, and um, just before we move into part one today, um, we just want to see if there's, you know, sort of anybody has any specific questions or um, comments they want to uh, sort of post before we move forward. I know we there may not be, which is fine. We haven't covered too much yet. Um, I see Marilyn here. Um, hello, Marilyn. Thanks for joining us from Houston. We're, we're covering much of the country, which is great to see. Um, and we appreciate your comment about, it sounds like you're um, perhaps in the role of maybe working with a nonprofit and thinking about how to uh, use data in ways that are most effective. So that's great. And I think the materials we're going to be covering today um, you know, these are materials that we've really adapted for a school board and school committee audience, but they're materials that we've also developed workshops around for practitioners and I think are also applicable to people who are in other settings who are working with schools and with educational settings. So I, I see some people are still typing. We're going to keep moving forward and, and Jess or I may just be responding in chat or we may be getting back to your questions at another point. Um, so at this point, and I'm going to turn it back over to Jess, and we're going to move into part one of today's workshop. OK, and Erin, I see you're still typing. So uh, we'll get to your question um, in just a few minutes. So now we're going to move into the first part of today's workshop. And the information in this section is going to focus on the intersection of data literacy and culture. So data literacy is a foundational skill for educators, but we know from a lot of research that the idea isn't just about having data literacy skills in place. That doesn't guarantee its broad use. Instead, data use needs to be supported at all levels of the education system. So whether that's the teachers in the classroom, you know, all the way up through the school committee members. And so Sarah is going to begin talking about 
how we can begin to build a culture of data use. So let's, I'm just going to forward the slides here. All right. So in part one today, we really want to focus on this intersection between data literacy and culture. And Erin, I'm just reading your comment here. And it's just, it's just such a nice fit with what we're going to be covering in this section. And, and I look forward to sort of additional follow-up questions you may have. Um, I hope that the content we're going to be covering here is, is really going to be applicable to sort of these, this issue around a culture of data use that you're, you're clearly already thinking about. So you, data literacy really involves understanding the properties of the data at hand, including the limitations, right? So what does the data, what does this particular source of data not tell you? And also understanding how you can use data to inform policy and practice. Now, culture has been defined in many ways, but we, we really like this definition you see here, which is, was posed by Jeffrey Wayman in a former um, 2012 RELNI webinar. Think about culture as the way things get done when nobody's looking. How do we go about doing life or doing business in schools when, when no one's there to watch or observe or monitor? And we're asking you to think about these two terms together because data literacy is important, but these skills are most effective when they're, when they're applied within a positive and trusting culture of data use. A strong culture of data use really sets the foundation for effective data use. And we've observed that school board members can play a role in supporting a data use culture within their district. So our goal in part one is really to provide you with a better understanding of what a strong culture of data use looks like and how you as board and school committee members might think about your role in helping to support that in your, your local context. So now I'm presenting to you a definition of the culture of data use. And this definition really lays the foundation for our workshop. And a strong culture of data results when an organization believes in continuous improvement and regularly puts that belief into action. Schools and districts that have a strong data culture emphasize collaboration, empower teachers and administrators to make decisions, and demonstrate key values and beliefs. And it's our experience that trust is also an important element of a strong data culture. So trust between the school board and the district administrator and school administrators. We know that that is oftentimes an issue, and we know that it's a really important element of a strong data culture. So I want to give you a moment now to just read these elements again and reflect on what they mean for you in your context. And remember the main idea that Sarah just introduced, which is that with a culture of data use, there are organizational systems and structures in place that ensure this work is ongoing supports continuous improvement, and is happening when no one was, nobody is looking. OK. So now we're going to begin to outline the five elements of a culture of data use framework. And this slide represents our initial outline of the culture of data use framework. And we're going to talk through each element in detail and then present the final culture of data use framework. So first, to provide you a little bit of background on how this framework was actually developed, uh, this framework was developed by researchers at RELNI and it began with our review of what we had observed working in schools and districts and working with them, supporting their, um, their data use practices. And what we found is that there are several significant areas of focus related to establishing data use practices that are part of the cultural norms and expectations of how the work of teaching and learning gets done on a daily basis. So that really shaped this framework that we've developed. And today, as we focus on each of these five elements, we're going to attend specifically to how these elements are applicable to school board members. And this figure shows the main concepts that support a culture of data use. The initial design from this framework includes the leadership as the foundation, get my pointer down here. We have the leadership that's at the bottom here that's supporting the four other elements in this framework. And along the right side here of the, of the framework, it's really about the learning of new skills and knowledge. And at the top right, our focus is on developing the internal capacity through collaborative inquiry skills. And just below, the learning addresses deepening knowledge and literacy required to use data effectively. Along the left side, the topics are structured around communication. 
At the top left, the framework addresses the critical importance of establishing systems that provide access to usable data. And just below, the issue of communicating a vision of effective data use is identified, with a focus on how these practices will support improvement over time. So take a moment to enter into the chat which of these elements you think a school board members might have the greatest role to play. And we know that this may vary across districts, so we're eager, eager to see what you have to say. We see a couple people typing. So again, just take a moment to see or identify which of the elements you think school board members might have the greatest role to play. So think leading a culture. That's great. Clarifying expectations for data use. You changed your mind, Stephanie. That's fine. <laughs> You're allowed to do that. Yeah, probably both, huh? Yeah. yeah. Could be. As we're going to talk about, right, there's, I think there's a board role in multiple elements. Great. OK. So feel free to keep going, and we'll, we'll see what you have to say about that. And before we get into the details of each one of the five elements of a data use, of the culture of data use framework, I want to provide a case example of one of our Urban School Improvement Alliance districts. So this district, District A, is a suburban district in the Northeast. It serves approximately 7,000 students of diverse backgrounds, and it has a five-member school committee with a student representative. It, um, recently hired a director of planning and assessment who was tasked with integrating the district's many different data systems. And when I spoke to that director, she had the following concerns upon starting her position. The first was around data management. And she said that there were many data systems that did not connect well or flow to one another. Another concern was data access and use. They have a student information system that is not user friendly. And educators have to combine multiple sources of data by hand. In terms of the data system training, there was a need to increase knowledge about the data systems in order to facilitate their use. And unfortunately, there was also a lack of useful reports. And educators had to produce many of them manually. So we're going to keep this district in mind as we move through each of the five elements of the culture of data use framework. So a key element of a strong data use culture has to do with clear expectations for data use. And we see in the chat box that many of you are, are identifying this as one role in which the board can definitely play, has a role to play. So I like to think about sort of expectations around data use as the how and the why. Do people in the district understand how they're being expected to use data and why? And of course, expectations may change over time. So issues and priorities change, but people's skills around using data change as well. So if we think about District A, right? So we had this new data coordinator come in, and many different data systems and people being asked to use data in lots of different ways. Was it clear how and why teachers were being expected to use data? Well, it really wasn't, right? District teachers weren't provided with clear expectations about how to integrate many of the sources of data they were being asked to use. And teachers also perceived some ambiguity related to the purposes of data use. And as I'm sure you yourself have experienced when you're being asked to sort of crunch numbers and use data, but you don't really understand what the ultimate vision is for that, it can feel like sort of you're just sort of checking off boxes rather than engaging in something meaningful. So a possible board role in this, in this example might be to begin to work with the superintendent to think about policy outlining the district's data use priorities, as well as expectations for staff at multiple levels around using data. Now that brings us to the second element of the culture of data use, which is ensuring access to data. And school boards can play a role in access and accessing data and allowing that access to data for all levels of the system, teachers, administrators, and board members. So school boards can consider whether the data is accessed, coordinated, filtered, and prepared in ways that allow users to quickly and efficiently analyze and interpret the data. So you, each, uh, you do have a role in, um, each in, in allowing that access to data, and everyone else has a role in, in using that data for their different purposes. But the point is to make sure that 
there is access to usable data. And sometimes technology is there and can really enhance data use practices. You may want to consider what technology do you have in your district that is allowing greater access to data use and do practitioners and others understand how to use that technology. This may include data visualization systems or data dashboards. And it really, are they enhancing or, or acting as a burden to the data use practices, practices by educators in your district? So as we saw in District A, there were obstacles to accessing quality data, including having many disconnected and not user-friendly systems and not enough training on them. So as board members, you really can play a role in making sure that there is access to usable data. The next element in the culture of data use has to do with making meaning from data. So in order to have the sort of build capacity to make meaning from data, people really need a few different things, right? They need time to do this work. I'm sure as board and school committee members, right, your time is really limited, right? You're, you're all, I'm sure, you know, those of you joining us as board and committee members, you're working full-time jobs, and this is something that you're, you're sort of allocating extra time to. So how do you as board members build that time together? But how do you think about your role in making sure that there are resources that can support time for staff in the district? It also requires data literacy skills, as well as familiarity with systematic processes for working with data, which is something we're going to talk much more about in detail in part two. So in District A, it doesn't appear that many of the necessary structures to support data use were really in place, right? So there was disjointed access to data which ended up posing a substantial barrier to collaboration and dialogue about the data. And staff were sort of consistently confronted with competing demands for data use from different sort of different roles, from different parties within the district. And there was little time allocated for them to do this work. So in District A, the board might think about first just investigating staff data use needs, right? So sometimes that's a good place to start, right? Does, do assumptions around how people are being asked to use data, as well as how they desire to be able to use data, are they consistent with what the reality actually is in, at the building and administrative level? And then the, some work would probably be required to determine, you know, particularly in this, this example that we're talking about, what, what kind of time and resources would be required to integrate data systems based on the needs of staff in the district, as well as the board. And then the board can also, right, here's where we come back to budget, right? How could the board think about helping working with the superintendent to free up resources so that staff do have shared time to work and make meaning from data? I'm going to turn it back over here to Jess, talk about element four. Okay. Element four is really about building the knowledge and skills of everybody to use the data that you have available. So it emphasizes the capacity to use data. And in a culture of data use, there needs to be adequate professional learning. And this is taking place around data use, assessment literacy, and using data to inform decision making. And the professional learning needs to be integrated into daily practices in supporting teachers to build their content knowledge and data analysis skills over time. So the research has supported that when professional learning is integrated into daily practice, that this really is the most effective. And thus is why it's an aspect of the culture of data use. And the professional learning is differentiated in a culture of data use. It's supporting teachers' specific learning needs, and it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. So just as teachers differentiate their content delivery in their classrooms, the professional learning for, for teachers as well as administrators and even school board members in the district also works best when it's differentiated. And the professional learning related to data use is critical for school board members, but you can also play a role in supporting the structures that facilitate professional learning at the school level. And we saw, as we saw in District A, training around the data systems was not sufficient, and that posed a barrier to effective data use. And school board members really can play a role in helping break down those barriers. So the final element in the culture of data use is related to leadership for data use. And again, many of you are identifying this element as a place where the board might 
particularly have a role to play, which I think is definitely accurate. So in District A, it, it appeared that it might have been the case that the roles and responsibilities of school and district leaders related to data use were unclear. And we can certainly imagine how this might trickle down to teachers, right? So if, you know, teachers may be sort of being asked by different, you know, we've got the, the director of curriculum and instruction, and we have the director of special education, and we have the assistant superintendent, and we have the principal, and, uh, you know, sort of all of these parties are saying, hey, you know, we, we'd like you to be using data in this way. Um, but this needs to be consistent, right? People need to be sort of vertically and horizontally aligned when it comes to data use. So in a situation like this, the board may want to think strategically about job descriptions for leaders, right? So ensuring that job descriptions really articulate the roles and expectations of leaders when it comes to data use. And then as I was just mentioning, also making sure that roles and expectations are vertically aligned, right? So what, what teachers are being asked to do reflects what principals are being asked to do, reflects what people in leadership positions at the district level are being asked to do which are consistent with the priorities that the board is setting for the district. The framework for a culture of data use reflects an emerging research consensus around those elements, right, these elements that constitute a culture of data use. And we, we sort of want to make sure that you realize we're not just sort of pulling these elements out of thin air because they sound right or they sound good. Um, not only have our colleagues who've developed this culture of data use framework consistently seen these elements in practice in schools and districts that really are evidencing a strong culture of data use, but several research studies echo these key elements. And also a 2012 article in ASBJ, ASBJ also emphasizes the role of the board in working with the superintendent to support data use at all levels of the district. So how might the board work with district leadership to promote human capacity in a culture of data use, right? This, the, the how question is always the, you know, the interesting and often challenging question. Well, to answer this question, it's helpful to just begin by considering how expectations around data use in schools have been changing in recent years. So since the beginning of the standards movement, there's really been a strong element of accountability in looking at educational data, which I'm sure is not coming as a surprise to anybody joining us here today. Data use practices then focused on accountability tend to rely primarily on large scale aggregate data. So we're looking at the district level or the school level, um, sometimes even the state level, that sort of higher level of aggregation. And there's a heavy emphasis on information management or the collection of information at the organizational level related often to standardized assessment test results. But over the past several years, there's, we're, we're really seeing a shift away from this sole emphasis on accountability towards the use of data to really support teaching and learning. So the priority is shifting towards gathering individual data on student learning and collecting that data more frequently, which really requires that teachers have access to and know how to use relevant data. Thus, this primary focus on information management is expanding to incorporate knowledge management, which means thinking about the ways that the district can best support staff in developing knowledge and skills for data use at the classroom level. So the figure you see here offers another way to think more concretely about these changing expectations and what they might look like in practice. So in stage one, there's a primary focus on data for the purposes of accountability. But moving towards stage two, this focus expands to incorporate the use of data to consider the curriculum or what is being taught. But in stage three, we start to see this shift more to what people are doing. So looking at how teaching unfolds, right? The focus expands to incorporate instruction. And in stage four, evolves further to incorporate a focus on student learning. So the way that the board and district leaders support people particularly teachers and students, becomes increasingly important in stages three and four. And one of the reasons we felt it was particularly important to discuss this slide and these changing expectations is that it reflects the fact that teachers are being asked to engage in shorter and shorter data use cycles. And as that happens, we've observed that there can sometimes be a disconnect between district level data use priorities and the data that teachers actually are looking for to support student learning and instruction. So teachers are often looking for more formative data because that tends to be most useful as they plan and deliver instruction. 
But tensions can arise if, for example, the district has invested a lot of money in large-scale benchmark assessment systems, if this is not the data that teachers are necessarily wanting or needing to use for these faster and faster turnaround data cycles. So this is why we've suggested that it's really critical for the board to understand the data use needs among district staff. So if you think about your own district um, or your own community context, the board in your community, how would you characterize the stage your district is currently at? So think about the options you just saw on your screen. We're going to be moving to a poll here. These options reflect the figure we were just looking at. Take a few seconds to indicate where you feel your district is at. Or if, if you feel like, you know what, this is like something I need to think about. I need to go back and do a little bit more digging to sort of figure this out. Go ahead, you know, feel free to indicate that as well. Yeah, so as people are weighing in, we're seeing quite a bit of variability. But what we definitely are seeing is that, which is great to see, is that people are, you know, you are already sort of moving beyond, many of you, this, you know, a focus just on accountability to think about what's being taught, how instruction occurs, and really ultimately using data to focus on student learning. And some of you, which I think is great, are saying, hey, you know what, this is something I need to think about. Go back and find out a little bit more about. Great, so let's move back. And Jess is just going to wrap up our discussion here of the culture of data use. And at that point, we'll be taking a few minutes for questions. So be thinking about those as we sort of wrap up this section. And I'm going to turn it back over to her. Thank you. So as I mentioned when I introduced the culture of data use framework, I said that that was our initial, initial framework. We went through the elements um, that represent the initial framework. This, what you're looking at here, this colored framework on your screen represents the final culture of data use framework. So what we did is combine our own knowledge of the um, data use elements that are particularly important from what we've seen working with schools and districts and combine that with the research base to come up with this final framework. And it essentially mirrors the elements that we just discussed, but the titles here are a little bit more um, defined and, and further detailed. So I wanted to mention down here in this pod below, and I can use the, the pointer to show you, um, and there's a pod that says download today's files. There is a Foundations of Data Use workshop handout, and what we have in that handout includes many different versions of this culture of data use framework, and um, it, it incorporates a lot of different points for you to be thinking about. And those include um, versions that detail the research findings supporting each element, a version that gives you examples of data use practices that can be employed for each element, another version that describes the barriers to implementation that are common across each of the elements, a version of example policy and guidance to support a culture of data use, and lastly, a version with guiding questions for your reflection. So although we don't have time to go through each of those today, we wish that we did, we encourage you to download those files after the webinar and take a look at them, because we think that you'll find them very relevant. So I think we're ready to move on to part two of the webinar today. But before we do that, let's just take any questions that you may have um, at this time. And if you don't have any questions at, that, at this time, that's completely fine. You feel free to, to post them into this chat pod um, while, you know, while we're presenting, and we'll answer them at another question break that we have coming up in just a few minutes. We see Stephanie's typing, so maybe we'll just give her a minute to, mm -hmm. to do that. While we're waiting, Jess, you know, I, I know, you know one of the issues that you and I have talked about with Paul and with our colleagues here is, you know, I think sometimes a question comes up that comes up here is, well, isn't it more the role of the district or school leaders to set expectations for data use? And you know, we think this is a relevant question. It's a good question. And I, I think that the answer to that question or sort of the responses you're having yourself, <laughs> if you think about the answer to that question in your context, it really is dependent on local context. And when we think about a culture of data use, at first glance, yeah, it may seem like something that's up to district staff. 
However, our research and conversations with others, we've had some conversations with colleagues at NSBA. Um, you know, we've, we've talked with Paul about his experiences with the Massachusetts School Committee Association. We've looked at many of the state, state resources at your state school board associations. And, and we see a lot of great resources that are available to you, you know, through those associations um, that really reflect the idea that the board can play a role in supporting the de development of expectations for data use, leadership for data use, you know, sort of helping to set the stage, make resources and time available for people to work with data. I think that's really going to look different depending on your local context. So maybe it just looks like sitting down with the superintendent to have an initial conversation around like what, you know, so what are our goals for data use for people in this district? Or, you know, it might, you might be at a place where you're ready to talk about, you know, we're, we're doing this, but we want to make more time available, so how do we make those resources available? And Stephanie, I see your question here about the specific journal article. Um, all of the references in the presentation, in, including the journal articles, the ASBJ articles, this National School Board Foundation's report, those are all in the reference sections of the slide, which are available for download um, as a PDF document in that little download pod that you should see when um, on your screen. So um, yeah, definitely find those resources. I think you'll find them really useful. So at this point, let's move back to the presentation. We're going to move into part two. And this is really getting more into sort of your role as school board members and how you're using data. So when we think about using data, I think just sort of a good review, something we wanted to review is just different types of data and how they tend to be most useful. Given the current interest in and demand for measurable outcomes, we have observed, and I'm sure you certainly feel in your roles, this tendency to focus only on the quantitative measures associated with the outcomes. And it, I like to think of these quantitative outcome data as the so what. But we're usually also interested in the why. I think in, it's human nature, right? Like we like the story. We want to know about the process that led us to get to this place. And in order to attribute out, outcomes such as graduation rates or test scores to specific programs or policies, you also want to understand the process that contributed to those outcomes. And qualitative data, which tends to be collected via structured interviews or observations, tends to be much better suited to capturing processes that we care about. Often both quantitative and qualitative data are necessary to truly understand both what is happening, the so what, as well as why. Finally, um, as I'm sure those of you who are joining us as board members and school committee members are well aware, you may be especially likely to be provided with anecdotal information. So you're the people that parents and coworkers and neighbors and community members come to with their complaints, their accolades, their concerns. As you know, it's critical to keep in mind that while anecdotal information really can be useful, right? It helps you determine issues that may warrant further investigation. Unlike quantitative and qualitative data, anecdotal information is not data that's been collected using a systematic process. So if we think about different kinds of data, those really fit with thinking about what researchers have categorized as different observable stances towards data. So one stance focuses on using data for proving or showing that specific changes in some outcome we care about can be attributed to some program or policy that we've been implementing. Quantitative data, this proving stance, can also be useful if you simply just want to sort of do the dipstick test, right? You want to get a sense of, like, what's our current status, right? What's our current status on achievement or on graduation rates or our English language learner population? The other stance is geared towards improving or using data to better understand the processes that lead to some outcome. For example, the reasons behind increased stu student absence rates at the high schools in the district. This stance is helpful when the goal is to work towards developing changes in policies or programs or to learn more about why students are not or are or are not progressing in a certain area. When examining data, board members and educators typically move between these two stances depending on the purpose for using the data. 
But as school board or school committee members responsible for policy decisions at the district level, your interests and needs may most often align with the proving stance. However, we want to encourage you to just consider how qualitative data can be useful when your goal is improvement or focusing on the processes related to some outcome. So in part two of today's workshop, our focus is really on the structured database inquiry process. And this type of inquiry involves collectively using data to investigate a particular question. Research studies have actually found that the use of a structured process for looking at data can build capacity for school improvement. So a 2009 study, a quasi-experimental study of nine Title I schools, the schools that used an inquiry-focused protocol in grade-level data teams significantly increased student achievement. And you know, sort of just I, I noted this was a quasi-experimental study, which means that this was a study that really was was um, well designed to be able to more definitively, explicitly um, relate the cause for student achievement to this use of a structured inquiry process. And further, what I think is particularly interesting is the teachers on those data teams had a better understanding of how their instruction was actually related to the changes that were happening in student outcomes. Increasingly, school and district staff are being asked to engage in this kind of structured inquiry process. And as organizations as NSBA, likely your own state associations also have asserted, school board members and school committee members tend to use data more effectively when they're using a systematic process to analyze and interpret the data. In other words, regardless of whether we're talking about teacher data use to inform instructional practice or board data use to inform decision making at the systems level, a growing body of evidence supports the use of a structured inquiry process. And Erin, I'm just I'm seeing your question here. Can you give an example of using the inquiry process, which is a great question, because we're actually just getting ready to, to move through what we mean by that. And we're going to be using another example of a district here in the Northeast um, that we've been working with to think about um, the, the steps of the inquiry process and how that can be useful. So the use of a structured and collaborative inquiry process for working with data may be beneficial for several reasons. I think first and foremost, it really can help sustain focus and attention on an issue over an extended period of time. I think as board members, you are particularly subjected to competing demands and priorities, and sometimes it can be hard to sort of systematically stick with an issue over time when you've got so many arrows flying at you. And so sort of engaging in a systematic inquiry process can really give you a structure that can help you sort of see an issue through. Additionally, it really it allows the group of people, so in your case, a board or committee, coming to the data to think explicitly about their own actions, assumptions, and beliefs about what's going on and really put those on the table up front. And finally, the use of a systematic process leads to a structure for iterative cycles of, app action, of action and evaluation. So rather than sort of going, OK, we're going to go over here, we're going to look at this data point. OK, we're done, now we're going to go over here. It helps you to sort of go, OK, we've looked at the data, we've identified what we think is going on, we're going to take action, we're going to evaluate, which is probably going to help us to think about what we might do additionally related to this issue. So why a structured inquiry process? Again, coming back to this 2001 NSBF report, I think the statement here just really reiterates the value of using a systematic process to investigate issues using data. As I've you know, mentioned a couple of times, but I, I think it's worth saying again, as board members, as school committee members, we recognize that you're constantly confronted with competing demands and interests. So it's not just access to data, but also the use of a systematic process for making meaning from the data that can help you define an agenda and a course of action, and then to stick with that course even as other priorities arise and you know, challenges arise as well. So at this point, we're going to move to talking more in depth about what do we mean when we talk about a systematic or structured inquiry process. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jess. Great. So Sarah has just given us a really nice background of the research base and motivation for having an inquiry process. And what I'm going to talk to you now about now is the inquiry cycle. And this is a formal cycle of inquiry, which is going to be the main focus of this section of the workshop. 
So this cycle is from the National Forum on Education Statistics, the Forum Guide to Taking Action with Education Data. And it includes five primary phases or activities. The first is to seek information. And that's up there in the top left corner. The second is to access and gather data. The third is to analyze and interpret data. The fourth is to act. And the fifth is to evaluate. So this structured inquiry process is something that many of you may already be familiar with. I know a lot of states have implemented this inquiry cycle or called it um, the cycle of inquiry in professional development that they've offered to teachers and practitioners in schools. But it may be the first time that you as a school board member or as a district administrator are seeing this cycle and how it might be applicable to you. So let's just move forward and start to <clears throat> dive into it. But before we do, I want to introduce another district scenario that we're actually going to uh, refer to quite a bit as we discuss this um, inquiry cycle. So in District B, school board members heard from multiple upset parents that teachers were frequently out of the classroom and that children often had substitute teachers. So upon hearing this, the con this concern, the board took a series of action steps to investigate the issue. <clears throat> First, they asked the superintendent for the expenditure data on substitute teachers over the past three years. Given that data and the concern from parents, they began to consider a policy that would limit the time allowed for teachers to leave the classroom for professional development. Now as we go through the inquiry cycle, we'll discuss this course of action taken by the board. So step one of the inquiry cycle, which is to seek information, has a few guiding questions. The first is, what is our area of focus? And the second is, what questions can we ask about student learning that can be answered by looking at data related to this focus? So educators, including school board members, begin this formal data inquiry process by asking questions that will lead them on a search for data to help address those questions. The forum guide describes information seeking as including activities such as defining a meaningful and achievable scope of concern or unit of analysis, and clearly articulating the issue at hand as a critical question. So to be effective, data use should be driven by well-defined and consequential questions. And to choose a focus for inquiry, keep in mind what high priority objectives or goals are for your school and district. A focus for inquiry should be phrased as a question. And so let's talk a little bit about how do you actually find your focus question. There's probably a lot of concerns that you have in your district, but how do you really narrow in on what are those high priority issues or questions that you have? So Oftentimes, this is going to come from your district's strategic plan. And when thinking of inquiry questions, you want to focus on the factors over which districts and schools have immediate control. So for example, if we consider the scenario that District B was facing regarding the concern over too many substitute teachers, a question may be posed as, why are too many teachers out of the classroom? However, if you think about this question posed in this way, it's not an objective question. It actually includes a value judgment within it that cannot be answered easily with data. It's assuming that too many teachers are out of the classroom, basing this upon the anecdotal evidence that you heard from concerned parents. So a better, more objective way to phrase this inquiry question is how many teachers are out of the classroom on an average school day, and for what reason? This question does not include any value judgments and is more easily able to be answered with data. So other examples of inquiry questions include these examples here below that you can read. So just to let you know, I mentioned that this inquiry, pro inquiry cycle is, is often common right now for professional development for teachers. And when they undergo this process, their questions will most mostly focus on questions relating to student performance on standards and, and content, whereas yours as school board members or district administrators are really going to be focused more on broader um, policy level questions. Oh, I'm sorry, everyone. Um, I'm 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 
struggling with the mute process here, and I was talking to all of you while still on mute, so we're back. Um, I was just saying that as I posted in the chat box, I just want to remind you as we're moving through the structured inquiry process, feel free to just add questions or comments about your own experiences moving through working with data in your district. We will have time to address questions and comments at the end of this section. So step two in the structured inquiry process involves working to access and gather data. And here the key is to determine multiple sources of data that can help you answer the questions you've identified. And that really involves finding out, first of all, what data is available, including at different levels, right? So you, sometimes you may want to look at district data relative to state data or other comparable districts in your state, or you might want to drill down to look at school level data or classroom level data. And then you also want to look at what each data source can and cannot tell you. Something to keep in mind here is that asking specific questions leads to specific data requests, and that makes it more likely you're going to end up with the data that you want and need. So as Jess was sharing, an initial question might be, why are so many teachers out of the building on instructional days? But that question begins with the assumption that more teachers are out of the building on instructional days than in the past. And it leaves ambiguity about exactly what data the board would like to see. And you're often going to be reliant on district staff to pull the data for you. So when questions are sort of open to interpretation, they're going to have to make decisions about what data to provide you with, which may not end up being the data that you really wanted or needed to examine the issue. So if we rephrase the question as, what were district expenditures for substitute teachers in each of the past three school years, it becomes much more clear what data you're looking for, at what level, and over what period of time. Then for each data source, you also want to determine what the data can and cannot tell you. And what you see here is just a quick protocol for determining what a specific data source shows and what it doesn't. So when you look at sort of what it shows, what it doesn't, you get a better sense of what other data you're going to need or that you'd like to see. So for example, this data source source shows overall substitute teacher costs for the past three years. However, it doesn't really tell us anything about what costs were by school, and we don't know anything about the number of substitutes. So for example, maybe it, it ends up that there were similar number of subs across years, but last year the district just had more subs at a much higher pay rate because they had more experience or degrees, various reasons. Finally, this data doesn't tell us the reasons behind having substitutes in the classroom, which is also important to think about, right? So are people out for professional development, or are we just having more people out because there was a horrible flu last year, or more people were having babies, that sort of thing. In addition to pulling from several data sources related to a specific question, it's often useful to consider data, data at multiple levels of analysis as well. So we can start here at the aggregated data level. So sometimes you're really going to want to look at data just at the district level. Again, as I was saying, maybe the district compared to the state level. But you can move then from the aggregate level to the disaggregated data level. So here you're starting to think about things separated by school, by student grade level, maybe by certain student characteristics. And we can dig deeper into the subtopical or strand level. So strand, we're often thinking about student assessment data, right? So how are kids doing on multiplication versus algebraic um, computations, that sort of thing. But you can also think about it subtopically, right? So in this instance, we're talking about it. Maybe we want to look at the data by the reason for having the sub in the classroom. Not all data sources are going to sort of be applicable through all levels of data. So it's really assessment data here where we start to think about item level and student work level data. And this is often the kind of data that teachers are being asked with more and more frequently. So here I'm going to move back to you, Jess, to talk about our next step in the inquiry process. That's great. And so that brings us to the, the step three, analyze and interpret data. So guiding questions for this step are what do we observe in the data? You know, once we have that data that Sarah just talked about, what patterns are we noticing? And then what can we infer about our strengths and challenges related to this issue? And finally, what challenge shall we address, assuming that there are probably multiple challenges out there? 
So once you have the data from multiple sources in a form that you're able to use, the next step is to analyze and interpret the data in order to take appropriate action. So at this point, you'll have to draw upon your understanding of basic data literacy in order to make observations about the data and recognize the limitations in the data. So as Sarah was just describing, the data may show you some things, but not other things. For example, the data might show only one year of substitute costs rather than a series of years that support a, a broader trend. So this step requires formatting the data into a form that can be used, determining the purpose and the constraints of that data source, and drawing conclusions that are defensible given the data. So essentially, you want to be looking at the data, seeing what's there, uh, making it workable for you. And oftentimes, we know that when you request the data from your district office or um, you know, whoever holds the data in your district, that sometimes it's not coming to you in the manner that, that you would hope. So uh, you know, it could be that you have to do a little bit of work on your own to make it into a workable format and usable format. But then draw conclusions that are defensible and given the data. And, and don't move too far outside of um, you know, what, what the data is actually showing you. So you may have to work with the superintendent and, and other district staff to get the data that you need. And as I said, do a little bit of work sometimes to, to make it usable for you. But it often works best when you're able to be specific when asking for the data that you need. And as we discussed in part one of the workshop, when there's a strong and trusting culture of data use, board members and district staffs are able to work together as board members ask for, receive and make meaning from the data. So now I want to move into what we call the ladder of inference. And this is a concept that is useful in this stage of, of data analysis. Um, the ladder of inference was developed at the Harvard Business School. And it helps to explain how people jump to conclusions based on what they see or hear and how this can lead to poor judgments. So thinking back to the district B example of, of the school board jumping to conclusions about too many teachers being, being out of the, the classroom. So there's a series of rungs that describe how we move from what we see to what we do about it. So let's apply the ladder of inference to the scenario that we've just been talking about. So if we start at the bottom with observable data or everything that we might capture if we're using a camera, using our example, as a board member, I might find that over the course of several months, it seems like I'm constantly hearing parents I know complaining about their children having a substitute in the classroom. So as an observer, I find there's just too much data to attend to all at once. So I'm just going to focus on some of the data and ignore others. And this may be just completely, um, I'm unaware that I'm even doing this. But in this case, I noticed that two colleagues I have a lot of respect for tell me that their children have had a substitute in the classroom for almost half the school year so far. So I'm getting some anecdotal evidence there. And from there, I start to make meaning of the data by drawing inferences or making assumptions. I might assume, for example, that the district teachers are out of the classroom too much. I begin to talk about this with another school board member who tells me that the district is spending more this year on substitute teachers than in each of the previous three years. So my beliefs are then influencing the actions I take. For example, I might come to the belief that teachers in the district are attending too many professional development events. And I might advise that the board encourage a superintendent to freeze funding for teacher professional development activities that are occurring on instructional days. So as you can see, I worked um, my way up the ladder of inferences, uh, the ladder of inference. But there are several problems with jumping up the ladder like this. First, I moved from brief observations to beliefs that may be unfounded. And second, it's likely that I'll continue to self-select observable data that confirm my beliefs, ignoring others. And we all do that, um, and even it's unaware to us. So third, the actions I take are likely to reinforce the behaviors I notice, so these parent complaints. So I'm, sh I'm shaping my subsequent observable data, sometimes to the detriment of teaching and learning. And for these reasons, it's important to develop habits that help us actually move down the ladder of inference. For example, as a school board, you can establish routines or norms where people are encouraged to ask for evidence and identify assumptions and questions and question conclusions through a devil's advocate stance. So with that said, we also believe that coming back down the ladder once you're up there is really hard to do. So we recommend a habit of making use of protocols that actually encourage you to stay close to the bottom 
um, the ladder of inference and close to the evidence that you have from the start. So one of the resources that we have is, is a protocol that we think will help you do this, either to stay close to the bottom of the ladder of inference, or if you're up there, if you know that you're, you know, your school board may be um, acting in such a, a manner that there are a lot of um, assumptions driving beliefs and, and then actions, this data-driven protocol that I'm going to walk through now is something that you can use to format your discussion. So this version of the protocol comes from what's called the Data Coaches Guide. And it's a structured approach to conversations that you can have as a board to help you stay focused, but also help you achieve more balanced participation and to discuss data in new ways that support a deeper examination and discussion, discussion of the data than you might otherwise do. So the there are four phases. The first phase is predict. Second phase is to go visual. The third is observe. And the fourth is infer and question. Phase one starts with activating your prior knowledge. So here as a board, you would generate predictions and surface assumptions that people are bringing to the data and their understandings of the table. So you would talk about it, and you would have a conversation. You know, what assumptions are we entering with? And what are some of the predictions we're making? And these are some questions that you could actually, at a meeting, ask, ask one another. And when you're looking at data or when you're considering a, a decision that you need to make using data. And then from there, in phase two, go visual, you'd move into exploration and discovery by developing or examining the data that you have that's targeted, targeted toward your inquiry focus. From there, moving into step three, you want to start by generating descriptive, specific observational statements. So these are actually factual statements that are taken directly from the data, and they're not opinions. For example, you might note that the dropout rate has increased from 5% to 2010, uh, in 2010 to 13% in 2013. So factual statements coming directly from the data, looking at trends, and making sure that you're being objective. And then lastly, in the last phase, inferring question, you'd want to have your conversations focused around these observational statements. So generate inferences and questions based on what you've um, written as your observational statements. And the key here is to encourage and stay open to multiple interpretations of the data. There may not be one correct interpretation, and that's perfectly OK. But this is just a protocol to encourage exploring the data not moving prematurely to conclusions or decisions. And we have this graphic as part of our handouts that is um, down in that lower pod on the bottom that says download today's files. So in that handout packet, this data-driven dialogue protocol is available for you um, to use and print out and use maybe during um, one of your school board um, meetings that you have. OK, so now I'll turn it back over to Sarah to finish up with um, Step four. Right, so in step four of the structured inquiry process, the focus becomes acting on data. And this involves considering what are your goals for learning instruction. So here, we're talking about this issue related to teachers being out of the classroom, substitute expenditures. But this really goes back to beliefs about the fact that having a teacher consistently in the classroom is really important for student learning, right? Kids and teachers develop relationships. And when those relationships are interrupted, it can be detrimental. You also want to consider the potential root causes that might be leading to the patterns you're seeing in the data, as well as the action steps that can address the learning and instruction goals you have in the district. So based on your conclusions from data analysis, you first want to be clear about your goals for addressing the issue. And ultimately, the actions you take should be related to those goals for student success. In other words, your action plan shouldn't involve taking steps that aren't related to your original question or steps that can't be supported by the data. And this sort of goes back to what Jessica was talking about with this ladder of inference, right? You want to make sure that if you're going to go to the effort of engaging in this process and using data, that then you're really informing, you're using the results to inform the actions that you're going to take. And well-written goals fit the criteria for something called SMART goals, which may be an acronym you're familiar with. But that simply refers to the fact that your goals should be specific and measurable. They should be achievable and realistic. And they should also be achievable in a timely manner. Right? So it's always hard for us to sort of go, this is our goal for 10 years from now. 
to sort of stick with that over 10 years is going to be really challenging. So you want to break that up and think about, okay, so where do we want to be a year from now? Where do we want to be then maybe looking forward five years from now? How do we get there? So in this instance, maybe a SMART goal would be a 5% reduction in overall district substitute expenditures within the next two years. Once you've identified the issue in the data and the goals you'd like to set for student success, the next step is to consider potential reasons behind the issue or problem. And the graphic you see here, which is referred to as a fishbone graphic, it's just a visual aid for thinking about potential root causes behind some specific problem. And a completed fishbone really can just serve as a starting point for brainstorming, so generating ideas and discussion about the problem and potential changes to address student needs. So if you think about this issue we've been talking about, right, district, um, district expenditures for substitutes are rising, people are complaining about people, about others being from too much in District B, what are some other reasons, like what are some of the possibilities that as a board member you might be thinking about? You might be thinking, well, this could be what's going on or that could be what's going on. Um, go ahead and just type in some of your thoughts about what, what could be going on in this district that would lead to parents being concerned about teachers being out, about rising sub costs in the most recent year. Okay, yeah, so Stephanie, maybe teacher vacancies are increasing, right, and positions aren't being filled. And so that's absolutely, that's a really good one. That's going to be leading to increases in the sub-budget. Maybe people are leaving in the middle of the year, as Fred sort of chiming in there. These are some good suggestions. So these, and you can see some other things here that might be going on. So maybe there's people, you know, we have more people out due to illness. Maybe the district's implementing in some of its schools some major new shift in curriculum. And so that's, you know, people are being required to do more PD in, in, in the most recent year. Um, maybe there are just, you know, maybe there's increased testing. And, you know, for example, in the primary grades, sometimes teacher testing requires teachers to be out of the classroom to do that that testing individually with kids. So there's a lot of different things that could be going on. Um, and, and you want, right, a common core right now, absolutely, right? PD related to the common core, Stephanie, another good suggestion. And these actions that the board is going to consider taking are really going to depend on which of these causes seem most likely given what you're seeing in the data. So if the data suggested that teachers are increasingly out of the classroom for elective professional development more so in the past, then board action is probably going to look different than if they're out for required professional development, or if it's simply the case that an inordinately high number of teachers were out on extended leave in the most recent year. So moving to action steps. Before deciding on the actions that the board wants to take, you really want to think about which causes are within your control to change, which will likely have the greatest impact on the issue, and which can be addressed with time and resources available. So as, as we're all very aware of, sometimes the issues we're seeing in schools have part of, the, part of the reasons behind those issues anyway are coming from factors beyond the school doors, beyond the district borders that, that are really outside of your control. So you really want to think about what can we do with the time within our jurisdiction with the resources we have. And just keep in mind here that while I'm using the word cause for the sake of efficiency in language, um, at this point you're really simply making inferences based, about, based on the data you have available. As I'm sure you, you're hearing about more and more, um, isolating a causal link between our data and some outcome often involves some type of randomized controlled study. However, we really want to emphasize that we recognize that's not going to be feasible or even necessary in many cases. And by working through a structured inquiry process, this can get, often get you a long way in determining likely factors contributing to the issue that you're concerned about. So drum roll here. What happened in District B? We know you've been waiting with bated breath. This is a district that um, we and our colleagues have actually been working with. 
it actually turned out to be the case that substitute expenditures had been higher in the most recent year because a higher number of teachers had been out on extended leave. There just happened to be more people having babies and people out on, you know, for extended illness, deaths in the family. There would actually been fewer teachers out of the classroom in the most recent year for which there was data due to professional development than in recent years. So given that the data revealed an anomalous cause for the observed pattern in substitute expenditures, the board and the superintendent in the district decided that no action was necessary at the current time. We want to emphasize here that the concerns that these parents brought to a few board members were absolutely valid, right? And it was probably the case that they had children in classrooms where teachers were out on extended leave. However, by looking at the data and moving through a strategic process for using that data, the consensus that the board and the superintendent came to was that the hypothesis that teachers were out of the building too often due to professional development just really wasn't supported by the data that they had. So just moving now, I'm going to turn it back over to Jess to finish up here our discussion of the structured inquiry process and be thinking about questions you, and comments you have here because we're, we're going to take a little time at the end of this section. To, to We'd just love to hear from you about your experiences or your thoughts and questions about this process. That's great. So now we've reached step five of the data inquiry cycle, which is about evaluating where you are in the um, where you've come to in this inquiry cycle from your data analysis and exploration. So there's a couple of guiding questions here that you might ask when you've reached this step. And how effectively has the initial issue, issue been resolved? And what new concerns have arisen? And should we continue with our action plan or choose a new area of focus? So the results of your initial actions will inform whether you need to spend more time addressing the original problem or if you've met your goals and can begin asking a new inquiry question. At the end of the step, the inquiry cycle repeats, and you can again ask what high-priority high questions you would like to address and what data you'll need to help them. So in our example of District B, as Sarah was just men mentioning, there, there was an issue of, of long-term subs and teachers being out of the classroom. But the superintendent worked with the board to ask precise questions, like how many teachers are out of the classroom every day and for what reason. And the data supported that it wasn't that teachers were being out of the classroom more for professional development opportunities when they looked at that data. So the district um, considered new concerns and imagine that they found out that the long-term subs that were hired had actually had higher than average salaries because they had strong qualifications and many years of experience. So this new information may warrant the board to think about whether this is actually a problem as they consider the budget and student learning. So maybe they realize that these well-experienced teachers were, were actually great. You know, they were a great resource to have there, but they do have that tension of balancing you know, the budget as well as um, student learning and considering student learning. So one final note about this step is that it typically occurs at the end of a program, if you're evaluating a program, or, or close to the end, to ensure that there is enough time for the results to have been realized. And oftentimes, in your context, it may be applicable that it would be the end of the school year, or um, you're reflecting on, on data from the previous year, so that you do have enough time to um, look for trends and, and have results that um, have been realized. So to, to close out this section of the workshop, I want to just mention a couple additional considerations that you might want to think about as you're going through this inquiry cycle. So consider how you're going to document or monitor progress. What data are you going to be collecting? And how often are you going to talk about that data and, and bring it back for discussion? So in the example of District B, as they're thinking about this issue of substitute teachers, you know, this was something that they didn't just do in a week span, that they were looking at over time to collect enough data to make sure that they were giving, getting evidence from multiple sources and so that they could really um, make a very informed decision about that. So just a reminder to check in on that and reflect on your process. And now to close out this section of the workshop, we've provided you with a big picture of how school board members can use the inquiry cycle to identify priority questions gather related data, interpret that data, act upon it by setting goals and identifying root causes, and monitor progress towards meeting identified goals. 
So throughout these efforts, remember that the data inquiry cycle is just that. It's a cycle, so you may need to refer back to certain steps throughout the process and as more data is collected and as new research questions arise. So at this time, I want to open it up to some questions, and I want to invite Paul to speak as well to um, offer some, some of his thoughts or answer any of the questions that come up. Yeah, and Paul, um, I think you're probably seeing here that we've got um, Aaron and Stephanie have asked um, a couple of really good questions that I think that you, um, well, we know that you certainly could speak to. We've had some conversations about these very issues with you. Um, so Aaron is asking, do you see this inquiry process happening primarily on subcommittees and then brought to the committee or just done by individuals and then presented or done in a work session format? Um, and she's also, I think, bringing up this really good point about, you know, if the board typically is meeting once a month, how do you, how do, you do this work more consistently, particularly because of open meeting laws? Well, let, let's start with a couple of things. We, uh, Arlington, we meet uh, twice a month, and we do meet in subcommittees. And a lot of the hashing out does happen on the subcommittee side. So you really need to give yourself the time in order to do this. Um, open meeting laws? Uh, you need to post your agenda to reflect what you're going to be talking about. So if you're talking, you know, if you're talking about budget, and this is a budget item, uh, it, it can come under that category. So uh, being able to describe, you know, what what you, what the context of your conversation is is, is kind of important uh, in terms of fulfilling it. At least in Massachusetts, every law is a little different. Uh, in terms of the way it's handled in Massachusetts, uh, where I play, is, is pretty strict. Uh, we have to warn the public through our agenda what we're going to be talking about. Um, I think that answers the questions that I see so far. Yeah, Paul, and Stephanie asked, which I, I'm, I, and I have a couple thoughts, and you may have some thoughts as well, right? So this issue of the difficulty sometimes in identifying formative data that helps you sort of monitor progress in between, sort of working towards progress on a goal. Um, you know, I think one thing, you know, that can be useful for the board, and, and Stephanie, I don't know your context, so maybe this is something you've already done, but... I find even just for myself that when I'm coming to an issue and I want to think about using data to look at that issue, I just need to wrap my head around, like, what's the data at hand, right? So figuring out are there indicators that we can use to monitor along the way. Um, you know, one of the things that we were mentioning earlier is also this issue of qualitative data, which, you know, I think that there is probably some some further explanation that would be required there and, and you know, um, be happy to have you reach out and follow up, Stephanie. But I think, I mean, you know, I think sometimes we, we don't think enough about how um, talking to people, you know, interviews, observations, document review can also be helpful. So it doesn't just have to be our, our huge databases that can provide us with useful information about the process along the way. Um, Paul, I don't know if you have any other thoughts about um, sort of checking in to monitor how you're doing as you work towards a goal? Yeah, I think the, one of the keys is when you set the goal, uh, say that if, if, if it's a district annual goal or a superintendent's annual goal, you're going to want to ask a question, how do we know we're making progress towards the goal at the time you set it? So that if you're asking a, a question of, uh, how are we going to improve fifth grade test scores uh, in mathematics? And you're instituting a couple of uh, items that are budgeted, uh, for example, adding math coaches to the fifth grade um, and uh, improving some uh, um, uh, interventions within the fifth grade. You can ask specific questions, benchmarking as you're going along. Have the, has the coaching been in? What, what do you think the impact of the coaching is? Uh, do you think we're making progress towards meeting the, uh, the, the end of the um, year student achievement goal? So build it in from the start by knowing what your goal is and what the action steps are involved with it and see what uh, kinds of uh, information would naturally flow out of that. Great. These were really good questions. And uh, again, we're, it's so great to have Paul here. Just like the wealth of knowledge and experience you bring, Paul, is just like totally right on with these, these great questions that people are asking. So um, 
as we just wrap things up, I'm going to turn it over to Jess, and then we're going to be hearing a little bit more from Paul. So we only have five minutes left in the workshop, and we're going to talk now, move into what we're calling the system integration. So how do you bring all of these things together? And there's been some research that suggests that the district and school adoption of these data-driven decision-making practices that we've been talking about really requires a focused coordination of many different elements of the larger education system. So you need to have some support mechanisms in place in order to do this. And you have to also consider, how is this process going to function across the entire district and at all levels of the system? So the point is really is that it's not just happening with the school board or it's not just happening with the teachers. It's really across all levels of the system in order for this to be really effective. But now I want to turn it over to, to Paul to talk a little bit more about this system integration and some of the roles that the board can play, as well as the superintendent and district leadership can play. Uh, well, th this really needs to be a partnership between the board and the superintendent, because uh, the goals are not, you know, we, where we find the challenge is parsing out the difference between a superintendent goal and, and a district goal because they're often very closely aligned. Massachusetts has a new educator evaluation law, which requires the superintendent to present to us a professional practice goal and a student achievement goal that is specific to, to her, and we must evaluate her on those two goals. But uh, having a collaborative environment in which we uh, come up with the goals is, is very important. We actually spend a, ver a lot of time doing that. Uh, and there are a couple of things that, 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 that are just good advice. One is don't be afraid to be terse and don't be afraid, uh, afraid to point to actual needs. If your fifth grade is weak, and the parents, everybody knows it. Call it out, create a measurable outcome, and go for it uh, publicly. And, and as board members, what we need to do is look at the critical needs of, of the district as well. For example, in Arlington, our high school is held together by duct tape. And the accreditation folks came by and says, if we don't see uh, significant improvement in 10 years, we're going to yank your accreditation. So uh, that has become a goal in ma making all the steps we need to, to advance that. And it, it, it is a very public goal in that we're, we're, we also need to use that goal-setting process to build public support for for a uh, for an eventual ballot question and town meeting action in order to get that done. So having a small number of goals that everybody knows that there's sort of a mantra that the board knows, the superintendent knows, the teachers in the district know that everybody sort of understands and relates to and finds meaning to is, is an essential part of the process. And then your goals need to lead to action steps that lead to the desired outcome. So it, it, it's got to be a, a through line. I hate that term, but it's really sort of like a bus. Everything has to line up. You establish your needs. You look at your action steps. You look at your desired outcomes. And you evaluate as you're heading forward to that. And um, as far as the culture, you just have to build it. Um, if we as a school committee or a school board are asking for data and talking about data and thinking about data in public, uh, it, it sets that culture. If our evaluation of the superintendent is based on student achievement data and other outcomes we want, it sets the expectation going down into the district. Um, if we're doing this, we need to understand that we need to uh, have professional development for ourselves to understand the data we're looking at. And if that's the case, the principals need to do that professional development, and the teachers need to do that professional development, regardless of what the costs are in District B for the substitute costs. It's sort of an essential way of doing business. But the culture really begins uh, with what is seen Every couple of weeks when your school board meeting is on the local cable because the people who are involved in the system, the parents who are heavily invested, the teachers, uh, the people who count uh, in terms of forming opinion as to what's going on, 
take a look at what we're doing at the board level, and if we're modeling it and if we're doing it the right way, that message will get through. You know, we are a district that uh, uses data, is informed by data as we make our decisions, and, and, and that's sort of setting expectations. It's setting the culture and, and, and making it happen, and it happens one step at a time. So I see we are getting very close to our end time. Um, we thank everybody for being here and sticking with us today. Um, this is, you know, we're taking time out of your day. At, we, we know is already a busy time of year, which I think really demonstrates your commitment to thinking about how to use data for informed decision making, as well as building a, a district culture of data use in your context. Um, as maybe what I'm going to ask if it's possible, Jenny, to do. Um, I just want to share just some, some closing things that we need to share with you as we're wrapping up. But I see people are, are, are using the chat box, which we love. Um, Elaine has asked people, um, are there examples of data points that you're looking at on a regular basis? So if people want to respond, um, please feel free to do that. We encourage you to think about next steps that you can talk about with your fellow board members. Um, or, or go back and take based on what we've been covering today, or questions that you're having. And we're going to be giving you um, our contact information at the day, um, at the, at, or not at the day, at the end of our time together today. So just moving forward, um, one thing we wanted to draw your attention to is that within the next couple of months, the rel -Me is actually going to be having a new resource come out, which I think is is going to be a fantastic resource for people to really be able to use in their own context. right? So these are going to be workshops that are online, not this kind of a live workshop, but actually an online workshop that you could attend, that your board could attend together. And moving through much of the content that we've moved through today, um, there will be another workshop on planning for an evaluation. So if you're going to be thinking about doing an evaluation of some district intervention or program in the near future, there will be one there covering that content. Um, so be watching for an announcement coming out about that um, in the coming months. Just a reminder, um, the U.S. Department of Ed really likes us to gather feedback. And it's really helpful for Jessica and Paul and I and our technical team today to just understand, was this useful? What could we do better? Um, so please, it's very short. It's going to take you two minutes. Um, if you can just log in, maybe as soon as you're finished here today, just give us your feedback. It's anonymous. We'd really appreciate it. So thank you. This is where we're going to end. Um, just really appreciate you being here today. Uh, it was fun for us to put this together. We've had great conversations with school committee members, school board members, other colleagues here at RELNI. Um, we hope it was useful. We encourage you to reach out if you have additional questions, additional comments. Um, and this webinar will be recorded. So you can not only download the PDF of the slides, but you will be able to access the actual live webinar. So um, if you think it was so amazing and fantastic that you'd like to say to your board members, we need to watch this together, um, we encourage you to do that. So um, Peter is going to do uh, our sign off. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Peter. OK, thank you so much, Jessica and Sarah and Paul. And this concludes today's Skill Builder webinar. Have a great weekend, everybody. You can sign off Adobe Connect. Just close your browser and hang up the phone. Bye-bye. <laughs>